Welcome to the Pulmonary Hypertension Association's PHA Classroom e-learning event series. I am very pleased to present today's webinar, Starting Out the New Year Right, Making a Commitment to You. My name is Amanda Nguyen, and I am the Patient Education Associate at the Pulmonary Hypertension Association, and I will be moderating today's event. Today's program will include a presentation by Chris archer -Jico. The presentation will be followed by a brief question and answer period. During the call, please note that all lines will be muted. So if you have a question, feel free to submit it using the chat function on your web interface. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions aloud by using the raise hand function on the web interface later in the call. And as a reminder, today's webinar requires a web login as well as an audio call-in. So if you're not yet logged into the web portion, you'll want to go to readytalk.com and type in 565-3004 under Join a Meeting. And also please note that today's call is being recorded. At the conclusion of the webinar, please take a few moments to fill out the brief evaluation that will pop up in your Internet browser once you've logged out of the webinar. We uh, value your feedback and use it to help shape future PHA programs. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our presenter for today, Chris archer Chico. Chris archer Chico is the Nurse Coordinator of the Pulmonary Vascular Disease Program at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She has been caring for pulmonary hypertension patients for more than 19 years. She is a member of both the PHA and PHPN and has presented at many PHA conferences. Chris received PHA's Outstanding Medical Professional Award in 2008. In 2012, Chris was recognized by Johnson & Johnson's Campaign for Nursing's Future when they chose to profile her career as a pulmonary nurse in their electronic newsletter. Welcome, Chris, and thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I'd like to thank the PHA staff for inviting me to present this webinar today. And I'm going to talk about starting the new year right, making a commitment to you. As we reflect over this past year, many people begin to make goals for the upcoming year. So I challenge you, why not start the new year outright? How about making a commitment to yourself to achieve your best health possible? This webinar will provide some inspirational ideas on how to take charge of your health while living with pulmonary hypertension. My objectives are to teach how to become more proactive with your health. I'm going to review some easy steps about creating a medical binder, planning ahead for your physician appointments, obtaining routine health screenings, and keeping your immunizations current. I'll also explain how to understand that the importance of three key factors that can dramatically improve your health, medication safety, proper nutrition, and exercise. And my third objective will be to show that certain psychosocial factors such as engaging in social interactions, alleviating stress, managing fatigue and depression, and incorporating spirituality can provide you with additional health benefits. The first step is creating a medical binder. The medical binder could be a helpful tool to help you keep track of specific health issues so that you feel like you're more in charge of your health. You can get a notebook or journal book of any shape, size, or material. It could be a three-ring binder or a spiral-bound journal. You could purchase something with a place to hold a pen or pockets for different pieces of paper. It should have blank pages so that you could write some important details that would be something that you would need to refer to, such as questions that you may have for your next physician appointment or items that you wish to discuss. You want to keep your, your binder a way that's organized so that you easily have your information at your fingertips and can refer to it. I made a list of some important details that I thought that you may be able to put in your notebook. However, this will be your notebook, so you make it organized the way that you feel most helpful. So you could list your physician names and addresses and fax numbers. 
you can put your list of your medications. And don't forget to include your vitamins, your herbal supplements, and you can list your drug allergies. And again, this is a place where you would be able to refer to your medication list without trying to be pressured to try and recall what your exact dose of, say, digoxin is. You'll be able just to go back to your notebook and pull that out. It's also helpful to include your pharmacy phone numbers, your local retail pharmacy, your mail order pharmacy, or specialty pharmacy. Include the phone and fax numbers. You can list important information regarding your various medical conditions and past surgeries. Again, so when you're in front of another physician and you're trying to recall when you had that gallbladder surgery, you'll be able to remember if it was 1970 or 1980. Um, you're not going to be pressured trying to recall the exact date. You can also list dates that you've had your last immunizations. And we recommend that you get copies of some of your blood work or test results. And again, you can share this with your other physicians your most recent echocardiogram, your EKG, your six-minute walk test, your chest x-ray, your pulmonary function test if you've had them. It's all a way that you can share that information amongst your doctors. Other information that you can include would be copies of letters that you may have received from your doctors. If you were recently admitted to the hospital, your hospital discharge instructions, um, and I'm sure that that would include your most recent uh, medication list, and perhaps you were recently admitted and medications were changed and you can't recall them right away. So it would be on that list, and that kind of, again, takes the pressure off of you to try to recall it. If you have a living will or health care directive, this could be included in your binder. And then any other additional information that you find would be helpful um, when you visit your doctors. Now the PHA has developed um, an empowered patient online toolkit. And I've included the web address at the bottom of the page here. Um, it has um, many helpful documents that you actually can download and you can type in your information and then print it out and put it in your own medical binder. So you can use those documents or perhaps you want to use those as a template to make your own. Either way would be fine, but I felt that they were very helpful documents. Now when you go to the physician, um, to me every visit with your physician is an opportunity where you get to improve your health. And by that I mean it's a chance for you to communicate effectively with your physician and nurse and share information. So I think you should really take time and plan ahead for each visit. Consider how you're feeling. How have you been since you last were there? Is your breathing still the same? Are you having any symptoms that you find concerning? Think about your medication list. Are you comfortable with what you're taking? Um, do you have any questions about your medicines? Is it time that you ask for some refills? And how about discussing with your doctor and nurse do you need any more testing to kind of reevaluate your condition? Is it time to have the, the testing to update, you know, how your condition is, if things are nice and stable, or if you need to be worried about things progressing? You can also include any questions that you have, any items that you wish to discuss. And I think it's important that you keep all of your physicians up to date on your health status. If you have any changes or when you visit your PH doctor, he feels something's different, you need to share that with your other physicians to keep kind of everybody on the same page. Don't forget to see your other physician specialists, the dentist, the eye doctor. It's really important that you kind of think of yourself as a whole being and don't forget to do those other kind of maintenance um, appointments. Remember, something like your dental care is very important. If you have you know, severe gum disease and your teeth are decaying, if you don't take care of that, that puts you at risk for having other health problems. So take the time to think about your other appointments and, and seeing your other specialists. It's also important to keep up to date with your routine health screenings. So routine health screenings are recommended as guidelines to help reduce your risk of illness. 
you'll want to discuss with your doctor when it's important for you to get these routine screenings. It will be different for different patients because of their family history. So I'm just going to review these very simply, and again, you will have to go back to your primary care provider and discuss when it's appropriate for you to get these studies done. But generally, mammograms are done to screen for breast cancer, and they're usually started when a woman is age 40. Pelvic exam and pap smears are a way to screen for cervical cancer. Those screenings usually start around age 21. Colonoscopies are usually started about age 50 as a way to screen for colon cancer. And again, I know many people are a little bit frightened to get these screening studies done, but if they do find something abnormal and if an intervention can occur, then you have really helped yourself by improving your chance of survival and um, you will have a better health outcome. So it's really important to get these screening tests done. Blood work, screening for diabetes, cholesterol and triglycerides. Prostate exams for men, screening for prostate cancer. Those usually begin at age 50. Comprehensive vision exams are also important to screen for things like glaucoma, cataracts, retina problems, perhaps the need for eyeglasses or corrective lenses. And osteoporosis screening is usually done for women who are postmenopausal, um, screening for the loss of bone density and a uh, risk of fractures. Immunizations are also important to keep current. So immunizations are a small dose of a dead or weakened version of harmful germs. By receiving an immunization, your immune system will then produce protective antibodies against these harmful bacteria or viruses. Then when these bacteria or viruses are out in the community, you're already going to have antibodies that will protect you from serious infection. So as you know, um, this is the time of year when we've had um, the serious flu season. So every year it is recommended that you get an influenza vaccine. These vaccines are designed to protect you from the circulating flu virus strains that are going to be out in the community that fall. So it's really important that you get the annual flu vaccine. The Centers for Disease Control reco recommend that getting vaccines is the best way to protect you from the flu. Another vaccine that's important is the diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis vaccine. This is a vaccine we've probably all received as children, but as we've grown older, we've kind of lost some of that protection. So it is important to consider getting a booster vaccine. Again, you will discuss this with your healthcare provider, but this vaccine is generally given about every 10 years. The pneumococcal vaccine is a way to protect yourself against common forms of strep pneumonia and pneumococcus. It's given about every six to 10 years. And the shingles vaccine is now developed, and it is a one-time vaccine that patients who are age 60 or older receive. It is a way to protect yourself against herpes zoster, or the shingles, which is a painful viral infection that takes several weeks to recover. So if you're interested in finding more about vaccines, I found a website that is the cdc.gov slash vaccines that has a lot of information um, so that you can read more about these immunizations. Another way to have um, safety and be proactive with your health, I'm going to review three key factors. Um, the first will be medication safety. So it's really important to know your medications. You should know the brand name, the generic name, the strength of your pill, what the dose is, how it should be taken by mouth, um, or if it's something topical, or if it's an IV medication, et cetera, how often you should be taking it, the frequency, you should understand why you're taking it, not just because your doctor said you should take it. You should understand the beneficial effects and the potential side effects. 
I really recommend that you carry a medication list with you at all times. And you can easily put this in your wallet. Um, you can write them all out on a wallet card and stick them in your wallet so that wherever you are, when you need to refer to um, or relate what your medicines are, you can go to that wallet card and pull it out and know that you're giving the correct information to the health, your healthcare providers. It's also really important to be um, storing your medicines in an appropriate location. So you really want to put them in a place where they're away from heat and humidity and sunlight and children and pets. So I know a lot of patients store their medications in the bathroom closet, and really the heat and the humidity from bathing and showering um, can help to break the medications down, and then they won't be quite as potent. Likewise, sunlight will help degrade medications, so that you should not be storing your medications on a shelf um, next to a window where a lot of sun comes through. A couple more tips about medication safety. You should follow your physician's directions for monitoring your medications. So if you require routine blood work, it's really important that you get that done. Certain medications, and the one that I can think of off the top of my head is Coumadin, really needs to be dosed carefully following blood work. Um, if blood work isn't maintained, then it just puts you more at risk for having complications. So um, if your doctor asks you to get the blood work done, it's really important that you do so, again, for your safety. If you have questions or concerns regarding your medicine, you do have many resources available to you. Um, you have your physicians and nurses, and then the pharmacists that are working with you. So not only um, the local retail pharmacies, but if you use a specialty pharmacy, those pharmacists are also available to help you with questions. Do not interrupt your medical therapy by allowing your medicines to run out. So please don't take your last medication and then call your doctor's office and ask for a refill. Please allow your physician or pharmacy to have about seven days minimum um, to reorder your medication. You never know if your medication needs a pre-certification and then there's more paperwork and a couple more days or will go by before we can actually get your medication refilled. So please don't run out of your medication. And when you do receive your refills from the pharmacy, please be careful and check the label. I had a patient who went to her local pharmacy and she knew her doctor was going to start a new medication. She picked up her bag from the pharmacy and when she got home she opened the bag and there were two bottles. So she took the medication out and just filled her little medication dispensing um, uh, jars. And as she started taking the medicines over the next couple weeks, she noticed she wasn't feeling well, and she just couldn't figure it out. So she went back to her original bottles, and accidentally the pharmacist had put in someone else's medication in her bag. And so she was taking medicine that wasn't even directed for her. So I really want you to be your own best advocate and double check the label, that the, the medication is the right one, that it looks the same. And if it doesn't, please call your pharmacy immediately and discuss it with the pharmacist to make sure no mistakes happened. If you are prescribed a new medicine, please let all your other physicians know because that's another little safety check that they can look at your medication list and double check to see that there will not be any drug interactions. I do have patients who are on multiple, multiple medications, and I appreciate when my patients call in and say, you know, so-and-so started me on this new medication for my foot pain, and I like to be able to go back and double check to make sure that my patient's not at risk for having any drug interactions. Take your medications as prescribed by your physician. Please don't adjust your dosing on your own without talking with the nurse or your physician. Because even taking extra diuretic can cause electrolyte imbalance and really put your health at risk. So please go with the directions from your nurse or your physician. Don't adjust your medicines on your own. And don't 
stop any medicines without speaking with your physician because there are some medications out there that really need to be tapered slowly before discontinuing. And likewise, if you are having a new symptom and you need to speak with your physician, give them a call. You really shouldn't be trying to take medicine that one of your family members have at home. So if your husband has um, narcotic for knee pain, um, you really shouldn't be um, taking that just because your back is hurting. You really need to talk with your physician um, so that the appropriate medication is prescribed for you. And it's really important to store medications in a secure place. I think we're all pretty cognizant to be careful with toddlers and children and keeping medications away from them. But there's also concern about teenagers. Um, I think sometimes they want to be a little experimental and they're very fearless and they may want to try one of your pain pills to see how it makes them feel. So please store those away in a secure location where they really don't have access to it. And once you are, are completed um, with a medication and perhaps there are pills that you haven't used, Please talk with your doctor or your pharmacy about how to dispose of them properly. Don't leave them laying around the house again where children can get into it or pets. Um, it's just best to get them out of the house and dispose of them properly. So a second key factor that can have major impact on your health is exercise. Exercise can have several benefits. Strengthening your muscles and, and improving your physical conditioning you will have better stamina and endurance and less fatigue. You will have reduced breathlessness. You'll be able to do activities with less shortness of breath. And if you get yourself in good condition, you may actually be able to decrease the amount of supplemental oxygen required. I know that would make many of my patients happy. And it will help boost your mood and reduce depression. I found this picture of this little family exercising, and it just made me smile. Look how fun, how much fun they're having walking out in the woods together. And exercise helps promote social interaction, and it makes you feel good. It gives you good self-esteem that you did something good for yourself, and it will improve your quality of life. Now before starting any, exer any new exercise program, it's important to discuss with your physician if this is right for you. He or she may be able to give you some guidance on, on goals that are good for you based on your medical condition. And if you've never exercised before, consider enrolling in a formal pulmonary rehab program. Um, these programs provide both educational and exercise sessions. Usually, the pulmonary rehab programs start for 15 weeks where patients come in and exercise three times a week. Um, and the education in these sessions will include proper body mechanics, how to breathe, um, good breathing techniques, proper nutrition, and they will touch upon some psycholog psychological issues such as depression and anxiety. The exercise sessions will Im include how to stretch, properly and um, to help improve your flexibility, and then working your upper body, your arms and shoulders, and strengthening your lower body, your legs. So once you finish the initial program, you will um, be able to consider enrolling in a maintenance program so that you can maintain what you've gained um, during that initial program. Now some insurances cover these programs for patients with pulmonary hypertension. However, not all. So if you have an insurance that does not, um, do not fret and don't despair. I have a really easy way for you to get some exercise, and that's really walking. You don't need any special equipment with walking. Um, you have the flexibility to do it when you're able to. There's no charge for it. And if weather is an issue, um, you can go exercise just by walking in a big warehouse store, um, like. Um, you know, a big Target or a big Walmart and just walk up and down the aisles and that will be a good way to get exercise without any cost to you. And other options for exercise that my patients engage in is biking. I have some patients who do swimming. I have patients who do dancing and they just have so much fun. One of my patients is actively doing Zumba 
And while I realize that's a very active form of dancing, when she's not able to do it, she just stops and laughs and, and makes a joke and then gets back into it after she catches her breath. But if that's too aerobic for you, you could consider doing something like line dancing and just have some fun. Whatever form of exercise you choose, I recommend that you begin slow and then really build to work up your time. So you could start for two or three times a week, um, again, for 20 minutes or 30 minutes, and then just gradually increase from there. Listen to your body. If you become very short of breath or fatigued, stop and rest. Don't allow yourself to do more than what you can realistically manage. It doesn't benefit you at all if you overexert yourself. And if you develop a serious symptom such as chest discomfort or dizziness and lightheadedness, stop your activity and then go back to your physician and discuss these symptoms with your physician. He or she may need to think, consider doing some additional testing just to make sure you're okay with exercising. Another key factor to help improve your life is diet and nutrition. So making good diet choices is a way that you can have a positive impact on your health. And the benefits of good nutrition are that you're supporting your body, your muscular skeletal system, your, your muscles and bones, and, and your organs, your heart, your lungs, and you're providing them with nutrients and energy for metabolism. Making good diet choices will help you to maintain a healthy weight, and it will reduce edema, and it will give you energy. Now, many patients do have special dietary needs based on their particular medical condition or conditions. I'm not going to have time to go over a lot of um, various diets um, in this webinar. However, if you need help understanding the best diet for yourself, you can ask your physician or nurse to schedule you an appointment with a dietitian at the, ho at the hospital where they practice. And that dietitian will sit with you one-on-one -on -one and help identify what are healthy um, choices according to your health conditions. My tips that I'm going to talk about today, I actually gained um, from the PHA's Patient Survival Guide. Um, Diane Wilcox wrote a really nice chapter on what to eat when you have pH. And I'm going to borrow a couple of her suggestions because I thought it was a really nice reference. And I encourage you to take a look at that chapter in your book. The most important diet that the majority of my patients are on is the low salt diet. And the reason that we talk a lot or teach a lot about the low salt diet to our patients is because when you take in excess sodium, it causes you to retain water in our system. It can lead to problems like systemic hypertension or high blood pressure. It increases the water and fluid in your blood vessels. It will cause increased swelling and edema, and it can lead to heart failure. So you know it's very important in a pulmonary hypertension patient to keep control of salt in the diet. And we recommend a diet about 1,500 milligrams to 2,000 milligrams of sodium a day. So as a rough estimate, that's about 500 to 600 milligrams of sodium a meal. It's really important to read labels. Many foods are really high in sodium, and you may not realize it even when you taste it. Most importantly, processed foods and packaged foods and certain frozen foods are really, really high. So please compare the labels and try to make the best choices for you. Please refrain from salting foods when cooking. We really recommend that you try and flavor foods using fresh herbs or lemon juice or spices or garlic. It really gives it so much more flavor and you won't miss the salt that you had been using. I also recommend that you remove the salt shaker from the table because having it so close is just going to give you a reason to, to use it. You'll see it there and you'll think, oh, I need to use it, where if it's not even on your dining room table, you won't even miss it. So I also caution you to be aware of hidden sodium in condiments and sauces, things like salad dressing, ketchup, soy sauce, 
steak sauce, barbecue sauce. I know they taste good, but they really are loaded with sodium. So try to limit the amount or pay attention to how much sauce or salad dressing you're using on your plate. And over time, you're going to change your taste buds or your palate, and you really will enjoy the lower salt foods. You, and when you taste something salty, it will really be a turn off. So a couple additional tips for eating healthy are when you go shopping, choose fresh, frozen, or canned fruits and vegetables. Again, look at the label. Try to look at the low sodium or no added sugar. Choose lean cuts of meat. It's good to include chicken and fish in your diet. And for dairy products, again, try to select low-fat or non-fat dairy products. When you're home cooking, it's best to bake, grill, or roast meats. Really try to avoid frying foods in butter or oil. And vegetables are really best when you have them steamed or raw um, because that still retains some of the fiber, and the fiber is good for your diet. When you're out at a restaurant and you're away from home, um, I know it becomes a little more challenging to, to eat healthy. So the very first thing I can think is really watch your portion size. So many times these restaurants give you a big plate and then they load it with a big portion. So when you get that plate set down in front of you, really look at it before you dig in and think, is, how many portions is this? Is this really a double portion? And should I just eat half of this and take the other half home? And for your salads, you could ask to have the salad dressing placed on the side, and that way you can control the amount of salad dressing and therefore the fat and the sodium. Try not to fill up with the bread and butter, even though it's there on the table. And again, when you're choosing your entree, um, why not choose a salad or a vegetable over the french fries um, that come with that entree? That those are healthier options. And for a beverage, it's really so much better to choose water, maybe with a lemon wedge on the side, or tea or coffee over a sugary soda. Now I'm going to change gears and talk a little bit about um, getting additional health benefits through some psychosocial issues. So the first that I have is the importance of social interactions. Um, it's really important to um, try and be social and get out and not be alone and isolated because feelings of loneliness are associated with a reduced quality of life. And there have been research studies that show that people that are lonely do suffer from more adverse health effects. Um, they suffer from more high blood pressure, depression. And social interactions are really thought to be a way to help us cope better um, by talking things out and laughing and being with other people. We're able to cope better and therefore have a little better emotional health. And I found some interesting resources if you would like to read more on the National Institute of Health. Um, part of that is the National Institute of Aging. And I put a website there. And they also have some resources if you're particularly interested in this topic that you can refer to. So there's many ways to stay connected today. Um, there's the cell phone, um, the computer through email, and social networking sites. Um, but even more than the computer, um, I think enrolling in a community activity is really a good way to get out and be more social. Um, you can consider picking up a new hobby, such as playing a, a musical instrument, um, joining a book club, joining an exercise class, being part of a garden club, um, going to the local Y and getting involved in some of their social activities. Or you can attend a community activity. There's always um, free music concerts in the summer or art festivals. Um, there's church services, flower shows. And my personal favorite is joining a local PH support group. I'm sure all leaders are always looking and welcoming new members. I know we are. So you're welcome to come join our support group if you're in our area. We'd love to have you. Another psychosocial aspect is alleviating stress. So we all know that stress really can adversely affect our health. And I'm not going to get into all the bad things that that can cause, but I do want to talk more on how to manage stress. 
And to me, managing stress is about taking charge. So it's you taking charge of your thoughts and emotions, your schedule, your environment, and the way you deal with problems. So if you can work to manage it and be proactive, that will be a great way for you to help alleviate stress. The ultimate goal is for all of us to have a balanced life with time for work, be it work at home or work outside the home, relaxation, and fun. So we want to balance those. And plus, we still want to have some resilience just to hold up under those unexpected life challenges that can happen to us when, say, weather affects our house and we have damage or, or something like that. So we want to not we still want to have some resilience left and that we can meet these challenges head on. So some stress management techniques. The first is to un avoid unnecessary stress. It's okay to learn to say no. So you need to know what your limits are and to stick with them. And so you need to decide how you can do this so that you're not overextending yourself. So if someone wants you to go out to the store and you need to go home because you're tired and they're staying out longer and longer, you really need to learn how to curb that and say, you know, I need to be home by this time because I get too fatigued. The second is to learn how to alter the situation. So you need to be able to um, express your feelings if there's an argument that you're part of. You need to learn how to calmly express your feelings maybe think about a way to compromise a little bit, but just try to control your reaction to it and, and kind of slow yourself down, take a couple deep breaths. The third is how to adapt to the stressor. Again, if you're in a st stressful situation, you may need to think, how can you reframe this problem? How can you think outside the box? And maybe just because you've always done something one way, maybe you need to just change a little bit of how you approach a problem, adjust your standards a little bit. And perhaps focusing on the positive aspects of the situation instead of the negative will be better for you. The fourth is to learn how to accept things that you can't change. Sometimes we just have to like let problems go and learn how to forgive. If you hold on to anger and resentment, that really is going to just contribute to your kind of distress, and it's not healthy for you. So sometimes you just have to let it go. And number five, make time for fun and relaxation. Um, and you really should do that every day. Um, it's, it's important. And as the sixth one is adopt a healthy lifestyle, which is definitely some of the points I'm giving you today. So fatigue. I know many pulmonary hypertension patients experience fatigue as a symptom of their disease, and it's important that they find a balance between rest and activities. So again, I did talk about not overextending yourself. Be flexible. Realize that tomorrow is another day. What you don't get done today can be done tomorrow. And for those patients who really are exhausted, I recommend take a nap every day. It's, it's okay if you do that. If, it will, if you do your morning routine or tasks and then you need to take a little nap and that energizes you so that you have a better early evening, then that's a good way to, to deal with that situation. So don't be ashamed of it. I know there's executives out there that take power naps so that they can stay efficient and on top of their game in the afternoon. Let other people help you. Um, they, it's important to be able to delegate some tasks and errands. Um, it not only does it help conserve your energy, but your friends and neighbors sometimes are looking for some way to be a part of your life and help you, and that's okay. Let them do that, then they will feel good about it. And again, as I said, if you don't have energy to participate in an activity, explain that you're not feeling up to it. Don't have any regrets or go on and on about your excuses. Just say, I can't do it, and, and let it go. Another issue that patients with pulmonary hypertension deal with is depression. And I know there's many times when you don't feel well and you may become feeling depressed, have a depressed mood. And I think that's okay, and I think you should realize that that can happen. But I also think you should think that you want to try and limit those feelings by taking some steps to work to change your mood. So you can choose a joyful attitude. 
and say, okay, today I'm not feeling good, but tomorrow I'm going to be better. And, and I like this little mantra, I'm in charge of how I feel, and today I'm choosing happiness. And I, I love that. And so if you set today to be your joyful day and you meet somebody grumpy, um, just realize that's their attitude for the day and you're going to be beyond that. Keeping active will help in keep your mood. Um, and spending time in the sunshine. I know it's winter and we have gray and kind of cold days, but I think it's really great if you can get out on those mild days and get some sunshine. Changing your routine will help also with managing depression. Um, you can do something new for yourself, um, buy something new. Um, uh, finding some humor, spending time with friends, going to see a comedy perhaps, those are all ways that you can um, help boost your mood. And last, if you feel you have depressed feelings that you're not able to manage, discuss this with your doctor. Um, there may be patients who do need some help with an antidepressant medication or speaking with a psychologist or counselor, um, and, and that's that's okay. Um, it's very important that we attend to your emotional health just as much as we attend to your physical health. So don't be afraid to reach out and ask for help. And the Pulmonary Hypertension Association has created a series of guides to help patients manage with psychosocial issues. Um, they're actually really nice. I've looked at them. And they've divided them based on different groups of patients, so patients who are long-term survivors, patients who are parents of children with pulmonary hypertension, caregivers, teens. So I included the website there, and you can definitely look at those and get some information. And another tip is keeping your spirituality. I think it's really important that you maintain your spirituality and keep with your faith. And even if you can't go outside your home because you're not filling up to it or you're too tired, there are ways that you can um, still maintain your spirituality. You can read an, a book or watch a show on TV or the Internet. You can invite church friends over, church members or clergy to visit with you. And you can pray and be reflective on issues that are important to you. So those are all ways that you still can maintain your spirituality. So I hope that this web webinar has provided you with some inspirational ideas um, that may help improve your life and help you feel a little more empowered as you manage the challenges of pulmonary hypertension. I really want to thank you for spending this time with me, and I think I'm going to be able to take questions. All right. Thank you so much, Chris, for that wonderful presentation. So now uh, we're going to take some time to answer questions. So you're able to send questions via the chat function on your screen, or you may ask questions aloud by using the raise hand function on your screen. And uh, if you raise your hand, I will call on uh, you as the questions come in. and. Once I do, please press star 7 to unmute your phone and star 6 to remute your phone when uh, you're finished asking your question. All right, Rosemary, I see that your hand is raised. Could you please press star 7 to unmute your phone and you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, yes. Um, what about um, in terms of nutrition, um, doing um, organic or alternative supplements? I've heard you know different people talk about CoQ10 and taking additional magnesium or anything like that. What do I need to stay away from? Um, I, I I think that you really need to discuss that with your physician. But I do have patients who um, do um, prefer taking some herbal supplements. Um, and what we do is we ask them what they're interested in taking. And um, if I'm not familiar with it, um, I will research it um, and include our pharmacists here at the hospital to make sure that there's not any hidden ingredients that we're not aware of to make sure nothing interacts with your other pH medications. Okay. Great. Thank you. Great. I see, Stephanie, you have your hand raised. Could you please go ahead and press star 7 to unmute your phone? Hello. 
Um, I just have a couple of comments. Uh, I think it's really important, along with your medicine uh, listed, to have a medical ID bracelet for all the pH patients. Uh, we tell everybody up here in Minnesota to try to do that, and then they'll know to look in their purse or wherever for their list of meds. And another thing is to contact your EMT fire department. My husband went there with the list of my information and my doctor, and they were so grateful to get it. So that way, if we have an emergency here, they know what they're going to deal with when they come. Oh, Stephanie, those are very good suggestions. Yeah, and then make sure your caregiver always has a list of your medicines, too, just you know, oh, that's happen. a good one. I had not thought of. Yes. Yeah, that's, I think that's really important. And mm-hmm. uh, another thing is I ask all my doctors, my pulmonologist, my cardiologist, my primary doctor, every time I have a t- test, I have them fax it to my primary or my primary faxes it to the cardiologist so everybody is in the same loop and that's everybody's perfect. got the same information. So I that's just wanted perfect. to just wanted to say that and thank you for doing oh. this today. Oh, thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for for that suggestion. I just have something to add. The PHA, uh, through our PHA store, we offer the emergency medical services brochure, and you're able to request that. They're free. Um, And basically, you can use that to fill out any relevant information that would be important to emergency personnel. And it comes with a magnet on the back side of the brochure, so you can tack that onto your refrigerator so it's in uh, plain sight in the case that Uh, emergency personnel comes to your house, they can see it right then and there. Those are really nice brochures. We've um, passed those out to our patients also. Yes, fantastic. So um, patients are more than welcome to visit the PHA website, the PHA store on our website, and uh, request those. Okay, I see that we have someone who just chatted in a question. The question is, where can I find low-sodium foods and products beyond what is available at my small local grocery. Do high-end places like Whole Foods have more selection? I think all grocery stores um, have a big selection. The most important thing is to read the labels. Um, and you really want to try and look at what each serving, how many um, milligrams of sodium are each in each serving and just try to choose um, the lower sodium versions um, of, for example, if you're going to buy a soup, you know, I think um, there's some uh, brands that are promoting as more low sodium. So you can check each of those labels. Um, it just is a little bit of extra time to read the labels, but it really will benefit you because they have much less problems with swelling and things like that. All right. So it looks like um, no one else has any questions. So. I would like to thank Chris again for being with us today and leading this great conversation and giving us a very informative presentation. And I just want to let everyone know that the recording of this event will be posted to the PHA Classroom in the coming weeks. So be sure to visit www.phassociation.org classroom to find out about upcoming events and watch our many recordings. So with that, thank you everyone for joining us, and I hope you have a great afternoon. And please be sure to also fill out the survey that pops up on your screen as you leave the presentation. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.